Okay, I think we're working now. Let's see. So last time we talked about 3D concurrent force systems. Before that, we talked about 2D concurrent force systems. Um, so we'd really just been talking about statics and forces and force components, resultants, and all that sort of thing. Now, today, we're going to move into um, some of the mechanics that go along with this course. So this course is part statics and part strength of materials or mechanics of materials, however you want to call it. Uh, and today begins the strength of materials part of things. So what this means is those forces that were uh, acting on a body, you know, whether it was the little eye bolt or whatever it is, um, they're going to have some effect on that body and it will um, be a thing that we're interested in. We want to know, does that body fracture? Does it deform? Um, is it fine? Uh, we want to know all those kind of things. So that's where uh, we head off into this uh, lecture. Um, later on, uh, we'll come back to some pure statics topics and we'll put some more uh, stress topics in. Um, in general, the course is divided with the first third, the third we're in right now, being axial forces. So things are either stretching or compressing, so they're getting longer or shorter. Um, in the middle third, we'll talk about flexural, so th things are bending. Uh, and the last third, we'll talk about torsional, where things are twisting. Um, but for now, we're in the idea that uh, we have axial stress. Um, you'll see also uh, the name normal stress. These are going to be equivalent for what we're doing, so normal stress. Um, this normal does not mean like average. This normal means perpendicular. So when we get to talking about the forces that are causing these stresses, that perpendicular part will pop out and make more sense. Um, in general, we're going to define a stress. Uh, if we were to write a sentence for stress, we're going to say that stress is equal to the intensity of internal forces. And that internal is important because we do want to know what's going on inside the body. So um, all these forces that we've been working with up until now were external forces that were applied to a body. And now we want to deal with the internal forces that are um, inside the body. Um, we will write pretty similar equations. Um, in general, all of these equations have the form, for now anyway, that stress is equal to a force. So that internal force that we talked about here divided by an area. And this area is the area that the force is acting on. So well, that'll make more sense when we draw some free body diagrams in a second. Um, but this is the general form for a stress equation uh, is a force divided by an area. So that'll give us units like pounds or divided by square inches. Or maybe our force unit is Newtons, and our area with that would be meters squared. Um, this pound per square inch, a lot of times we use PSI, pounds per square inch. Um, sometimes we use KSI, where the K is the K from the metric system, so a kilo, um, and this actually is equal to 1,000 PSI. So as these stresses get larger, a lot of times instead of writing thousands of number, you write uh, tens or twenties of KSI. Um, Newton per meter squared, that is also known as a Pascal. So Pascal. And um, a Pascal is a very small unit, so a lot of times you're actually dealing with mega Pascals, which equals 
a million pascals. Sometimes we deal with gigapascals, which would be 10 to the ninth pascals. Um, and so we have to work in both of these unit systems. Um, but in general, when we're dealing with stress, for now, we're going to be dealing with a force, an internal force, divided by the area that that internal force acts on. And that's how we're going to calculate all the stresses for today. Um, we just need to know what's the force and what's the area that we're talking about. Um, so let's start out with a really simple version and just have a plate, like a rectangular plate. We'll give it some dimension here and on this plate let's add uh, an axial force so we are dealing with axial stress the other thing that this axial stress category uh, specifies is that the force that we're applying to the body the plate in this case is an axial force the force isn't trying to flex it or bend it it's not trying to twist it it's trying to elongate it or compress it so it's either trying to stretch it out or make it shorter. Um, so we'll put our force this way. This would be a tensile force. It's pointing away from the body, looking like it's trying to stretch the body out. So that would qualify as an axial stress. Um, we needed some magnitudes on these forces, though. Uh, let's make them 2,000 pounds each. Uh, you might write... Uh, we had KSI over here. You have a corresponding to KIP, so KIP for kilopounds. So this is also 2,000 pounds. So sometimes when we get into big numbers for pounds, um, we'll use the units of KIP to not have to write you know five or six numbers down. You write two or three numbers down and write it in units of KIP. Um, so these are the same. 2,000 pounds is two KIPs. Um, so this is in static equilibrium, meaning that... Uh, summation of forces in the x-direction equals zero works and it applies to this bar or plate or whatever it is. Um, so I, this is about as simple as you can get but it has a very important point that a lot of people miss. So the stress that we want to do is intensity of internal forces. These are external forces. Many people intuitively look at this and they say, oh, there must be 4,000 pounds on the inside of this because I've got 2,000 pounds pulling one way and 2,000 pounds pulling the other way. Um, but that's not how it actually works. So to find an internal force, even on a simple thing, we need to go in and cut, cut it open. So I'm drawing a little line where you might imagine you're going to cut the thing open. And... Then we'll draw one half or the other. Let's draw this half. And this was in static equilibrium, and it's not exploding. It's not fracturing. We don't want it to fracture anyway. We don't. We don't actually know that it's not, but we don't want it to. So, uh, for it to not, for this piece to not move away from this piece, this has to be in static equilibrium. So there's our two kips external, that's this force. This is the internal force. For this piece to be in equilibrium, this internal force needs to be 2,000 pounds, not 4,000. If I put 4,000 pounds in here, then I have a net effect of this piece wanting to move to the right, um, which I don't want it to do. I want it to stay connected to this thing. So um, that's a common when you first look at these problem is thinking that, oh, if I've got two and two, then I must have four on the inside, but that's not actually how it works. Um, if I want to calculate the stress on here, so then axial stress or normal stress. So remember normal said perpendicular. This force is perpendicular to this area. Now I drew this area kind of raggedy because I showed it being cut apart. Um, when we idealize these at this level, these are all like perfectly flat planes and you don't have to worry about any irregularities in them. Um, everything's perfectly flat. Um, so it has some dimensions. 
let's just say that this thickness is um, a quarter inch off the page. There we go. Um, and then this width is uh, one and a half inches. So one and a half inch wide, quarter inch thick, and we put 2,000 pounds on it. Um, so if I were to calculate the stress, uh, this is a normal stress. The force is perpendicular or normal to this plane that I'm interested in. Um, and this particular plane is as good as any right now. I don't know, you know, uh, where exactly. I'm ignoring kind of some of the real world things. Um, for instance, if I look at the top, or well, if I look at this, just look at this, and I think about if I really did put a point load, so a load 2,000 pounds that's applied more or less at a tiny little point, then I probably have a really high stress concentration right here around that point. And then eventually it kind of averages out into something uh, well distributed. It may not take that long to average out. I'm just kind of being dramatic. Uh, but there is a concentration of where that point is applied. Um, we're ignoring this. The stresses that we're calculating, the one that I'm going to write an equation for over here, is this average stress. At the very end of the course, we'll talk about some of these peak stresses. Um, but know that the equations, until we get to the very end, um, are talking about this average stress. So it's well developed, it's distributed across the whole body, uh, and it's not concentrated at any single point. Um, so the equation is this form, stress equals force over area for axial normal stress, for an axial or a normal stress, um, we use the symbol sigma. And we say that sigma is equal to a force over an area and we just use F over A. Sometimes you'll use P. Um, some books use P for the variable for the internal force. May I don't exactly know why they use P. There's probably some reason. Um, but um, it does kind of remind you that it's the internal force and not the external force because a lot of times the external forces have F on them. So this is an internal force. So my internal force is right here, 2,000 pounds. The area that this force acts on is this blue area, one and a half inches by a quarter inch. Mm -hmm. So um, this just becomes a simple little math problem to do 2,000 divided by one and a half, divided by 0.25. 5,300, let's put it right here. And that would be pounds per square inch or PSI. Um, so that's the stress, that's the axial stress in this little plate that we drew. It's the normal stress that we drew. Um, it's the same thing, axial and normal are the same thing for what we're doing. Um, this number, we have to decide, you know, what does that number mean? Um, we'll get to that a little later, but in general, uh, if this is a steel, just kind of a generic steel, then uh, this plate would not even begin to permanently stretch until this number was about 36,000 PSI. So 5,000 PSI is not a huge amount for steels. Um, other materials, much you know, weaker materials, 5,000 psi uh, is a lot, but um, generally, you know, we're going to design parts out of steel and aluminum and things like that. Um, so 5,000 psi is not something we have to worry too much about, but we'll actually get later on um, into exactly, you know, how much room do we have before things bad start happening. Um, okay, so this is a super simple example. Um, I want to go over to SolidWorks and draw up something a little more, not super complicated, but a little more complicated. I want to do it in SolidWorks so that we can rotate and spin it around. Um, but let's see if I can get, I think there it is. Oh, it's kind of, uh, kind of really large there. Isn't it? Let's, oh, you know what? Let's do it this way. There we go, that's perfect. All right, um, so here's SolidWorks. 
and I'm going to draw what would be a clevis. Uh, so another reason I want to draw this is because if I just say the words, people may not know what they mean. So we're just going to draw one up. Um, and we're just going to kind of make it a generic shape as far as the dimensions go. But let's, let's see. We'll put some dimensions to make it a little more regular here in a second. So this will be the side view of it. Let's dimension this thing. Um, let's make this half an inch along with this one. Let's make them symmetric. Let's make this guy um, five inches long. Well, not like that though. Uh, we'll fix that in a second. Let's make make this one those are both half inch let's make it uh, inch and a half so that they're all the same uh, let's make these two lines vertical with each other and uh, collinear and uh, let's make this depth here let's set this at something um, 1.6 let's make it uh, two inches all right so this is a side view of our clevis. Let's extrude it so it has some volume. Um, I missed the handle. Maybe something in that range. That's two inches. Let's make it two exactly. All right, so normally uh, there would be a little bar that goes inside here. We'll, we'll work on that in a second. Um, but right now let's put a hole because normally there's some kind of pin that goes through this and the little bar that's in the middle. Um, so let's put uh, let's put a hole in here, and let's make it. Uh, actually, let's look down on top of it, and it's a circle. So there's some going to be some kind of pin that lands down in here. Let's make this pin have a radius of uh, a quarter inch, so that it's a half inch hole, and then let's set it maybe. Let's see what it is right now. Let's set it one inch in. There we go. And then we'll make this hole go through the whole thing. All right. So there's our there's our clevis. So um, the other part that would go in here would just be a flat piece that had a matching hole, and then there'd be a pin that goes through the two hole or the three holes and holds it all together. So it's a pinned joint. Um, and we'll call this piece a clevis, we'll call the other piece a tongue, and uh, we, there would be a pin also. I don't know if I want to draw all those parts. I'm mainly interested in this particular piece. Um, so let's go back to our paper and kind of draw up what's going on here. Actually, we'll do it on a isometric page so that we can be a little fancier, I guess. Uh, and let's draw kind of what's going on with this thing. All right, so let's see. We've got something like this. That's not the line I want. <laughs> Sorry. I was looking, I was doing something else in my head, I guess. Um, I actually want this paper turned this way. All right. So here's the clevis, and I'm not going to draw it exactly the same scale as what we had over there, but more or less the same shape. Um, you don't have to draw these things in isometric paper, but it does. If you're not super confident in drawing these by hand, then it uh, helps give you a, you know, just some guidelines on how to do it. Um, you know, f fitting the hole in here is always kind of tricky, but one, one mm -hmm. little thing you can do is you can go in and find where the hole should be and draw a uh, square around it. Now, I made this an uneven number, so that's, we'll just do it a little bit larger. And the hole will fit, you know, inside that square you draw so if you don't have a 
good eye for just putting the hole in there, then you can kind of do it that way. Um, now the piece that we didn't draw would fit inside here. So I'll, I'll draw it kind of a little bit smaller just so we can see where it would be. And uh, we'll, it would come out over here. I think we're gonna go off the page a little bit, but that's okay. Um, and so obviously all of this, all of this stuff would be not visible because it would be underneath this thing, but uh, this is kind of imaginary. Maybe we'll color it in. So something like that. Um, and then the pin would drop in, there would be a, a hole in this blue piece, a hole in the clevis, so the tongue, the clevis, uh, and then the pin would be through all three of them, holding them together. Um, and so this is kind of a typical pin joint. Uh, it's nothing particularly fancy. It's just an ordinary old thing. Um, it's relatively common and uh, we can use it as an example of a lot of different potential ways that this thing could fail. So I'm just putting that in there so we can kind of get an idea for it. So, uh, and then the force, I guess we need to put a force on here. So the force that I'm thinking of for this, again, we're, we're limited to axial forces so that things aren't flexing and they aren't uh, twisting. They're only elongating or compressing. So I'm thinking of a force that's kind of over here applied like that and then there's a matching force um, you don't always have to imagine the other thing as a force you could imagine that this is welded to a wall back here if you wanted to and the wall is doing the resisting of whatever force it's just basically applying the opposite force so we might draw something like this that just gives us a uh, mounting point sort of So there's our setup. Um, so we're pulling on this, this tongue um, and we want to see all the different ways that this might fail. And there's four different ways that we're going to be concerned with. Um, we've looked at one of them, not for this, but we looked at one way right here. You know, the, the clevis could break like this piece did. Um, and so going back to SolidWorks though, there are a couple of ways this could happen. So actually, let's... All right. So one thing that could happen is... Whoops, didn't want it to actually draw that. There we go. One thing that could happen is this face could could break. Um, there's a lot of area here. This uh, lighter blue colored area is relatively large. I don't remember the exact dimensions, but I think it was uh, maybe one and a half by, or one and a half this way by two, something like that. So it's a relatively thick piece of metal. I'm assuming this is metal. Um, but if we keep going, it does have a smaller area here because we had to cut that slot out for the tongue to fit into. Um, so there is less area here, and if we remember our uh, equation for stress, force over area, so the smaller number I put in for area, the larger sigma becomes, and sigma is the stress. In general, you want lower stress. Um, so if I put a smaller area here, I have a higher stress, which is more likely to fail. But if I keep going, I have to drill that hole in it also. So now there's an even smaller amount of material supporting the, I don't remember if we actually put a force on here, but uh, whatever force that we will put on here, you know, over here, uh, we need to maybe 5,000 pounds or something. Um, it all has to be supported on a smaller area. And if we keep going, then the areas get larger and then they're larger again until we're, we've looked at all of the clevis. Um, so, any one of these could fail, um, but in general, what we're most interested in is the one that's most likely to fail. So assuming that there's not some big crack back here, some manufacturing defect, then this area is much larger 
than this area here where we're halfway through the hole. You can kind of see the hole still there. Um, so uh, we're going to be more concerned with calculating this as our area. They all have to support the same force. Uh, so let's let's make those calculations over. Let's get us a new page and make those calculations. I'll draw a free body diagram of it um, just to do it. Uh, so remember, here's what we're looking at. We're going to cut, uh, you know, imaginary cut through here. So basically right through the center of that hole and pretend what it would look like if we did that because we think that's the worst case scenario for the force being supported by the smallest amount of material in the clevis. Now we're not looking at the tongue right now. It could be that the tongue actually is worse off um, because there's only one thin piece of it versus two parts to the clevis above and below the tongue. Um, but we're just looking at the clevis right now. So uh, we would have something like this. And we're going to go halfway through that hole. And then we're going to have to look at the bottom of it also. And uh, we don't need to draw too much back there. We just need something like this. Now, the force, let me get my red pin. Remember, we had it kind of mounted to the wall back here. Um, so what that effectively does is creates a, an axial force holding it on the wall. Uh, we'll say that's 5,000 pounds, which is coming from the fact that uh, we're going to assume that this is 5,000 pounds here. And the wall is basically having to react to that 5,000 pounds, so that's all in equilibrium. Um, so each one of these will support a portion of that 5,000 pounds. So um, not having any information that it's any other way, we're going to say that it's evenly spread up, spread out. So each one has to support 1,250 pounds, each one of these little blocks. Um, I don't know where to write that one. So the area that we're most concerned with that we think is most likely to fail with an axial stress failure would be these four. So each one of those is, um, I made them a half inch thick. And I made them, actually I didn't make their width here, but um, I made the whole thing, I believe I made it two inches. I don't actually remember. Normally you don't put dimensions on top of the drawing, but I'm kind of running out of room, so I just put it right there. Um, and then I think I made this guy a half inch radius. Let's uh, see if we can find some place to put that. No, I made it a quarter inch radius. I made it a half inch diameter. Okay, so the that would be that these are each one of these blocks would have if I did make that two inches, which I did now, whether or not I drew it in SolidWorks. Two minus a half inch is one and a half uh, but there's half on each side, so three-quarter inch. Each one of these is three-quarter inches long. All right. So my axial stress, sigma equals F over A. I can do this multiple ways. I could go in and say, well, one of these little areas has 1,250 pounds. And that area has 0 0.5 inches times 0 0.75 inches. And I can calculate that stress, 1250 divided by 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.75, 33, 33 PSI. So again, not that much. That's generally not gonna do anything to a metal. Um, another way I could look at it is, well, there's four forces 
So that's a total of 5,000 pounds. And there are four of these areas that are all the same. And I get the same number. So the five, well, actually this would be four times 1250 over four times the area. So the fours would just cancel out. So I'd get the same stress. So it doesn't matter which way you prefer thinking about it. Um, for this course, uh, the everything's going to be symmetric so you don't have to try and figure out well if, if this one's larger than that one and if one of them has a higher stress than the other we're not going to have to worry with that um, we're assuming everything spreads out evenly and it's all symmetric um, so that's the axial stress or the normal stress um, but what if that's not the way it fails you know we that's a pretty low number so so that doesn't really concern me if I make this clevis out of steel um, I probably should look at the tongue because it also has to support 5,000 pounds um, and it is uh, having to do that 5,000 pounds with the same width and the same thickness, but there's only one of those. Here there's two of those thicknesses. So if I draw the free body diagram across the hole, so again, kind of through here, um, but of the tongue, it would look something. I'm going to draw this piece of it. See, I'm on the screen. Yeah. Something like this. Um, and we'll make it blue because, well, no, because I'm going to shade the areas blue. So this is the tongue. That's the clevis. Um, so now I've got two areas. So I'm gonna assume that the force again is evenly spread out over those, 2,500 pounds, 2,500 pounds. Um, now the force isn't over here though. The force that's causing this is actually inside here, right? So I'm gonna draw it over here. It's actually pushing on the inside of that uh, hole that the pin is in. Uh, is where the force, how the force is getting applied to the tongue. Um, oh, well, but it's not 2,500, <laughs> it's 5,000. There we go. Um, all right, so I'd use the same, sigma equals F over A, but obviously I'm gonna get a different number because I have the same 5,000 pounds But the area now is, well, I didn't put my dimensions on there. Um, this thickness I made uh, 0 0.5 inches and it has the same 0 0.75 inches there. And there's two of those. There's the one here and the one here. So instead of four of those, I only have two. So I'm gonna have twice the amount of stress that I had previously. So now we're getting closer, you know, it's, it's still not a huge amount of stress for steel, um, most steels. So I'm not too worried about it, but we're getting closer to being something that, all right, we might worry about that. But I said there were four different ways that we might have to think about this pin joint failing. So that's one way um, is an axial stress. Another thing that could happen is maybe the pin, so I drew a red pin in here, maybe the pin itself fails. So I'm pulling on the blue uh, tongue and I pull it out and um, how it came out of there is not because it broke in half, but because the pin broke. So let's look at that. So I'm gonna draw a, just a plain side view of this one. Guess I should have drawn this blue because this is the tongue. I lost my color scheme, but that's okay. Um, the pin, I don't want to draw it red because I want to use my forces as red. The pin is sitting in here, something like this, and it is broken now. So this piece, the tongue with part of the pin came out of the clevis. So it's no longer a pin joint, now it's broken. Um, I, I envision 
different ways that things could break. Um, and, and that's how we go about uh, calculating the stress is like, well, if it broke this way, what would it, what would it look like? So here was the 5,000 pounds. And right before this thing broke, this mm -hmm. pin was having to support some of that. And this side of the pin was having to support some of that. And again, I'm going to assume they're symmetric. So 2,500 pounds on each side of the pin. Now, I made a couple of things different here. One of them is that I drew only half of an arrowhead on here. And that was on purpose. Um, because, remember, we were talking about a... Um, normal stress I'm trying to find my page normal stress where the force and area were perpendicular to one another but here the force this force is not perpendicular to the area that it's acting on in fact it's parallel in this case um, so this is not a normal stress because the force and area are not perpendicular and to signify that this is not a normal force I only put half an arrow so the half arrowhead, um, that equals a shear force. And you might think that this is a little ridiculous to have special arrowheads for a shear for force versus a normal force. But the reason is that um, most materials, maybe all materials if I thought about it, I don't know. But um, all the materials that we're going to deal with, behave differently in shear than they do in uh, axial stress, normal stress. So for instance, that steel that I've been talking about, the yield strength, so yielding means that it is about, it is uh, at this point, at this much stress, it the material, the steel, has permanently changed its shape. You've stretched it out, and it'll never go back to its original shape. So that number for steel, if you were talking about axial stress or normal stress that we just did with the uh you know right right here that number for steel is somewhere around 36,000 psi and the same number but for shear same material but for shear um we're going to use tau by the way <laughs> so tau to show shear stresses is about half of that. Now there's different ways to calculate what number to put in here. We're going to be really simple and be the most conservative way and just say that it's half. So 18,000 PSI. So um, that's why we make a big deal about making even the arrows different because you want to be sure that uh, when you compare this stress to the material strength that you're comparing to its shear strength not its axial strength because the shear strength is so much lower than the axial strength. Um, other than that, shear stress works the same way. So we have a special symbol for it. We use tau. Um, and again, we want to not use the force F, you know, or P. Um, so we give it its own variable for shear force V. So V is shear force. And then area is the same idea. What area is this shear force acting on? Um, so in this case, we have um, two forces, shear forces. Each of them are 2,500 pounds. And the area is, there's two. There's one area here, one area here. So these two areas make this a special case called double shear. So all that means is that we had to shear two areas in order for our part to fail. You can have single shear where only one area has to fail. You could have triple shear, quadruple shear. You could have as many as you want. Um, typically, you only really name single shear and double shear. Um, but you could have as many as, you, as your part actually had. Um, so these two areas, each one is, they're circles. So we're looking at it from the side, but... Uh, Remember, they're representing this round pin, so this is a circle. So pi 
uh, the diameter of that, um, I gave it a half inch diameter, right? Pi d squared over four. Um, so before we solve this, let's talk about pi d squared over four. Just to kind of as an aside, area of a circle. Probably most of you um, by default at this point, if you were asked what's the area of a circle, you're gonna say pi r squared which is completely true. Um, most of the time in engineering, you are going to use pi d squared over four. Same exact thing, you know, it's not calculating it any differently because uh, the radius is two, or, or the diameter is two radius, so it's the same thing. Um, the reason you do it this way, typically, is that um, when you're drawing, you know, a layout or whatever, when you're ordering, this pin, uh, when you're measuring this pin, you know, you're, uh, you've got your calipers out and you're, you're measuring the pin, you're not measuring the radius. You're not ordering a pin based on its radius. You're not talking about a pin or a bolt on talking about its radius. You're talking about its diameter or you're measuring its diameter. So most of the time, um, you're gonna see pi d squared over four in these type of equations just because Diameter is what you're normally referring to when you're talking about a pin or a bolt or something like that. So that's why I did it. It was pi d squared over 4. Um, so let's see what this number is when we calculate it. So we have 5,000 in the numerator divided by 2 um, divided by this denominator. So pi, um, I gave it a diameter of 0.5. So we have to square that. Uh, and then divided by 4. Got to make sure my order of operations will actually work. All right, so 12,000. 12,732.4 PSI. Okay, so now um, if we had missed the fact that this is shear and we were thinking of um, the yielding strength at 36, we're like, oh, well, yeah, it's, it's bigger, but it's not that bad. Um, but comparing to the yield strength, now we're getting really close. Um, and a lot of times what you do here is you calculate what's called a factor of safety. And the factor of safety just equals your um, allowable number, in this case, stress. over your actual number, the one you calculated. So in this case, our, our shear stress that we just calculated. And you want the allowable number to be bigger than the actual number. So you want uh, this to come out greater than one. So for us, our allowable number is 18,000, just based on the number that I just created. Mm -hmm. um, although these are realistic numbers mm -hmm. for steel. Mm -hmm. So we end up with a factor of safety of 18,000 divided by 12, 732.4, 1.4. Uh, there's no units, uh, it just cancels out. So this is one of the numbers that uh, is just a number, not doesn't have units. Um, so it is greater than one, which is good. You don't want a factor of safety less than one, um, but it's not a very big number. So it's part of this course. You'll have to calculate this number relatively often, um, but you're not going to have to figure out what this number should be. So it'll just be given. Use a factor of safety of 1.2. Use a factor of safety of 2 or whatever. Or calculate the factor of safety for this scenario. Um, but uh, as an engineer, you have to have some sense or some guidance or maybe there's a regulation that tells you you must have a factor of safety of whatever the number is when you're designing this product. Um, in this case, we're just gonna use it as kind of a measure. So um, we'll calculate it, you know, here's the strength, here's what you calculated, what's the factor of safety, or we'll use it as a design goal where um, maybe I'll give you the factor of safety and you gotta figure out how much force you can apply. So you just kind of start here and work your way back upwards um, using the same equations. Um, so, Shear force, shear stress, 
um, you do have to keep those separate from the axial stress, axial force, because the material itself behaves so differently in shear uh, than it does in axial stress. So uh, it's so much weaker. All right, so that's two of the ways that this could fail. So it could fail by breaking either the tongue or the clevis, you know, in two, fracturing it. Um, it could shear the pin. Um, another thing that could happen is maybe neither of those happen. The clevis is fine, the tongue is fine, uh, the pin is fine, but something still gives. So it doesn't actually fracture. So what could happen is uh, the tongue or the clevis could be pressed by the bolt so much that they deform. So there's the thing called a bearing stress. So a bearing stress is just when two things are pressing against one another. So um, a lot of times they're flat plates, you know, pressing against each other. Uh, but there are two items in contact. So in our case with this, um, the pin is in contact with the clevis and the pin is in contact with the tongue. Uh, so there are two things that are in contact. Now they're not flat, which does create a little bit of a problem for us um, versus something that's just uh, like the this clipboard pressing down on the table. You know, that's just a flat surface contacting another flat surface. That's pretty straightforward. Um, but when they're round, it does create a little bit of an issue. So here's the issue. Let's look at an overhead view of uh, the tongue. So here's the tongue. Didn't get it drawn too square, but it's in there. Um, and then it has a hole in it. And inside the hole, is a pin. Now I'm going to draw the pin a little bit smaller so that I can uh, maybe it that much smaller so that you can see the separation between them. Although in real life there's not too much gap. Anyway, this pin is inside this hole. And remember the tongue, so this is the blue piece right here. It's being pulled on right here, 5,000 pounds. And the pin, uh, when you pull this over, the pin presses against this side of the tongue. So, you know, more or less from here around to here is in contact. Um, the back side is not, you know, it's not touching. It's being jammed against the other side. And so this 5,000 pounds is spread out on this like blue curve here that I've drawn. Um, the problem is that it's not spread out evenly. So let's draw a little bit bigger pin. Uh, actually, let's draw the pin black so that uh, my arrows can be red. So this is a bigger version of the pin. And it's pressing on this uh, surface here. Actually, this I guess this could be the hole. Um, it'll work better this way. So the problem is that most of the stress is here and at the very edge it's pretty much just zero and then there's this uh, you know non-linear shape of all of these normal stresses applied to the surface there the bearing surface And so it, with it being nonlinear, it is difficult to just say F over A, you know, because yeah, the, the force is so unevenly distributed. Now, if these were flat, you know, just two flat pieces pressed against one another, then it's, it's evenly distributed. All you do is bearing stress is that force divided by the contact area. 
Um, here, the contact area is not the problem. You could calculate the area of the inside of this cylinder. That's not too bad to do. Um, but the force is so uneven that you can't really do that. So what we do is um, I want to draw a little free body diagram that's basically cut through here. So I'll draw this half. Uh, and this is the tongue. The, the, the clevis would look similar, just there'd be two of them. There's a top and a bottom. Um, so I'm going to draw this. All right, and so this curve in here, that is where this is happening. That's where all of this force is being pressed um, unevenly. So what we're going to do to be able to do any calculation with this that's not super complicated, um, but that gives us a decent approximation, is we're going to take this area, and we're going to call this the projected area. And that'll be the area that we put the 5,000 pounds on. So um, it's actually really easy to calculate bearing stress, but you do have to um, realize that we're doing another approximation. So the equation, uh, this one, all right, let's draw our force on here. So the, uh, the force is actually pressing on here, so I'll draw it that way. The force is 5,000 pounds. It's perpendicular to this projected area. So it is a, an axial stress or a normal stress if you don't want to think of it as axial. Maybe this one would be better called normal stress. Um, but we do often use a little subscript B just to say that it's a bearing stress um, to keep it a little separate. The force is 5,000 pounds. The projected area is the diameter of the hole, so this distance, this distance is just the thickness of the plate. I think we set those at half an inch. But um, this distance is the diameter of the hole, which we set also at half an inch. So I think we made both of these half an inch. And then we can calculate 5,000 divided by 0.5 two times is 20,000. Now, um, remember our uh, sigma, so it is a normal stress because the force and area are perpendicular. So I can compare it to my uh, yield strength, not the shear strength. Um, and now remember this yield, you may not know exactly what yield means. There's yield and ultimate, there's other strengths. Um, but basically this is just the one where if I exceed this amount of stress, either one of these, then I have permanently changed the shape of the object, which in general you don't want to do if you're designing some kind of machine. Um, so 36,000 PSI. If I get any more stress than that, then I have permanently uh, changed the shape if it's a sh normal stress. Bearing is a normal stress, and I've got to 20,000 PSI. So I'm getting really close again. Um, I do have a little bit of margin, but uh, I'm getting closer. So that's the third type of stress. So we did um, the axial stress for fracture. We did the shear stress for fracture, where we're just going to shear the pin. Um, we did the bearing stress. So what actually happens here if you exceed uh, the bearing limit is that uh, the hole, well, the hole or the pin, whichever is the softer material, one of them, the hole either stretches out, you know, it kind of gets elongated, or the pin gets a flat spot on it. And both, neither of these are necessarily catastrophic failure, fracture failure, but um, now you've got a lot of slop, you know, your, your mechanism here has uh, looseness in it. Maybe it's so loose that the pin just falls out because the holes have gotten so stretched out. I don't know. Um, 
And so that it's generally not a thing you'd want to have happen is too much bearing stress. Um, last thing, and then we'll call it a day. So this the fourth one is that, and we'll probably have to go to SolidWorks to get an idea on this one, that um, the pin doesn't fail. The tongue and uh, clevis don't have too much bearing stress. Um, they don't fracture across the, you know, across the little hole here like we thought they might, but they actually come in and tear out pieces of material. So since we drew the clevis, let's look at it. Let's get rid of this section view. So what I'm talking about is if you were to go in and cut out this piece. And we'll cut all the way through. So this is what I'm talking about the failure looking like. This would be called a tear out stress. Some people call it punch out stress. Um, oh, you can't, you can't see what I've got on there. Hold on. There we go. Um, so I cut out, actually let me redo it. So I drew this little rectangle and then I cut cut it out. Er, hold on. There we go. So I cut that out. So that piece tears out, or there's two pieces in the clevis. One piece in the tongue because there's only one side to it. Um, but the top and bottom would have to cut out or tear out. Like I was saying, some people call this punch out. Um, a lot of times punch out though is reserved for like you're making a cookie cutter. So it's the same type of thing, but um, you're punching shapes out of a piece of material. So this area, this area, this area, and this area. So these four areas have to shear. So this is a shear failure um, and it's called tear out stress. So basically the pins uh, and the clevis uh, and the tongue all stay intact, but they pull away from the clevis by ripping out this piece that was here and the piece that was down here. So that that would be tear out. So let's draw. I, I'm going to draw the ripped out pieces since they're not here. I'll draw what they would look like. All right. So they would be two of them, and they would look something like. There would be the one from the top, maybe. And there's the one on the bottom. So they should be the same size. They look a little different. Um, the pin basically, you know, pushes both of them out 2,500 pounds. So a 5,000 pound total. Um, and then the areas, the ones that I highlighted over here, those darker blue areas correspond to here and here and then on the back side also that I can't draw. <laughs> so there's another area back there on both sides. And so all four of those areas are the same. So just so you're over here again. Oops, didn't want to do that. There, there's two of them, and there's the other two. Um, so it is a shear because I didn't draw the force on here, but uh, there would be a force here, a force here, and then also a force on the back here, and a force on the back over here on those back side arrows or areas. So since the force is parallel, or it's not perpendicular to the surface, it's not a normal stress, uh, it is a shear stress, and it's called tear out. And it is a shear, so you do have to compare it to a shear strength. And so we're gonna give it a tau for a symbol, because we're using tau for the shear stress. Tau equals V over A, so just like all of our others, it's a force divided by the area that the force is applied to. 
and uh, the total force V is 5,000 pounds, or you can do there's four times 1,250 pounds. And there are four areas, each of which is this thickness was a half inch. And this distance, I don't remember, I think I made it one and a half inches, but it's the distance from the end of the plate or the clevis or whichever you're looking at over to the center of the hole. So you kind of go to the middle of the hole out to the end of the plate and that's this, I think I made that one and a half inches. So there's four of these, each one is one and a half inches by a half inch. Um, and we calculate that 5,000 divided by four divided by one and a half and divided by 0.5. So 1600 so not a huge amount of stress. Um, you do have the tongue in there though and um, it would be the same deal except it would only have one of those little pieces. Um, and I don't know that I actually measured from the center of its hole to the end. I think I just might have made that some random distance. I think it's actually a half inch though, looking at the diagram. We'll call it a half inch. I don't know if it's a half inch. Um, and so the tongue, so this is the clevis pieces over here. The tongue would have one of these pieces that I think it's a good bit shorter. And there's only one. So it would have two areas though, this area and the one on the back side also. I think this may only be an, a half inch though. And this is a half inch. And our forces, there's 5,000 pounds trying to push this little piece out. And then there's uh, 2,500 pounds of a shear force here and 2,500 pounds here. So our tau for this one, total of 5,000 pounds, two areas, each of which are, I'm calling it a half inch. I don't know if I actually even measured that by a half inch. And we get a much larger number. So 5,000 divided by two, divided by 0.5 twice, 10,000 PSI. If you remember, um, our shear strength, the one that I wrote down anyway, was 18,000 PSI uh, before the part begins to yield, and we're at 10,000 PSI. So we're you know, kind of close to that limit, but uh, we didn't exceed any of our strengths, which would mean mm -hmm. that um, under normal conditions, this part with the dimensions that we created should be safe. Um, it didn't exceed any of the yielding, any of the permanent deformation uh, stress numbers for four different uh, types of failure. So we looked at four, let's just name them all. We looked at an axial failure, axial stress. Then we looked at a shear stress, the one in the pin. So this might be a direct shear. We looked at um, the bearing stress. So pressing so much on the inside of the hole that either the pin or the uh, hole itself changed shape and didn't perform the way we intended it to. Um, and then we just looked at the tear out stress. All of these fall under the, the concept of the axial force um, because we always, the external forces were applied axially. They were only trying to stretch or compress the parts. They weren't trying to flex them or twist them or anything like that. Um, so this is kind of our introduction to, to axial stress uh, and uh, the different types of axial stress. We had a little bit on the 
mechanic side of things of the strength of materials. Next time we'll talk more about um, what these stress numbers mean compared to the strength that's associated with them. And we'll add in this new idea of strain. Um, and we'll do all that next time. Um, so I think for now, this should be enough to get us through uh, the next set of homework and the ideas of uh, stress, both uh, axial stress that is uh, normal and stresses that are shear stresses. And it's very important to keep in your mind the distinction between the normal stresses and the shear stresses because the normal stress and the or normal strength and the shear strength are very different for most materials. So you need to be consistently aware of which one you're dealing with when you're dealing with these stresses. Okay, we will um, look at this again next time, but we'll add on to it, and I'll see you on Wednesday.